I'm going to hold up this book long enough to get a thumbnail. I actually read this three months ago, and I've just been laughing at all of the comments which have been posted on the video I uploaded in March in response to John Piper's response to a teaser advertisement regarding this book. So not only did I upload the video before the book was published, what I predicted was going to be in the book was in the book. So let's get to what Bell actually says in this book. Uh, in the preface he states this, Please understand that nothing in this book hasn't been taught, suggested, or celebrated by many before me. I haven't come up with a radical new teaching that's any kind of departure from what's been said an untold number of times. That's the beauty of the historic Orthodox Christian faith. It's a deep, wide, diverse stream that's been flowing for thousands of years, carrying a staggering variety of voices, perspectives, and experiences. I guess that's ignoring the um, pre-Orthodox history, uh, which involves stamping out uh, various streams of thought. And I think that he puts this in the preface to the book because he wants to continue to play in the evangelical sandbox, even though theologically he doesn't line up with quite a lot of them. So in chapter 2, um, he brings up another way of saying life in the age to come in Jesus' day was to say eternal life. In Hebrew, the phrase is olam haba. So, yeah, this is correct. Um, although this may give readers uh, the suggestion um, that the Christian concepts of life after death are consonant with the Jewish concept of olam haba, and they are definitely not. He then uses Luke 18.30s to suggest that the Greek word ion doesn't necessarily mean forever in the way we think of forever. So I'm going to read Luke chapter 18, verses 29 and 30. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age to come eternal life. So the age to come being the ion or komai. He uses this to mention that ion can refer to a time with a beginning and an end. So this is important for an argument which he attempts to pose later. He also refers to ion as a particular intensity of experience that transcends time. He also tends to more graciously interpret passages of scripture than I think the original authors intended. Um, for example, he uses Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4 to imagine the age to come as, quote, an extraordinarily complex, interconnected, and diverse reality, a reality in which individual identities aren't lost or repressed, but embraced and celebrated an expansive unity that goes beyond and yet fully embraces staggering levels of diversity. A racist would be miserable in the world to come. So let's read Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4. In the days to come the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So, while this is describing a period of peace, it's also describing a period 
where other peoples are essentially going to be assimilated into Israelite culture and worship the God of Israel. I don't see it as uh, preserving a diverse reality at all. Now it's in chapter 3 which he starts going into um, his argumentation or concepts regarding hell. He mentions, uh, for whatever reasons, the precise details of who goes where, when, how, with what, and for how long simply aren't things the Hebrew writers were terribly concerned with. Um, that's one way to put it. Uh, I think another way to put it would be that they hadn't thought of that yet. He also attempts to limit the import of the word Gehenna to the town garbage dump in Jerusalem. Uh, this is something which Francis Chan uh, deals with in his book Erasing Hell, probably because uh, Bell mentioned it here, or Chan was simply wanting to be comprehensive, and I think he does resoundingly refute this idea uh, that Gehenna is only referring to uh, the Jerusalem garbage dump. You know, is actually referring to the final place of judgment after Judgment Day. Bell mentions Tartarus in 2 Peter 2.4. He says, it's the term Peter borrowed from Greek mythology, referring to the underworld, the place where the Greek demigods were judged in the abyss. So, while it is true uh, that the concept has been borrowed from Greek mythology. Um, it's also a specific place which is described in First Enoch. So I'll link to the passage in First Enoch chapter 21, which describes this prison for the angels which spawned the Nephilim, who are described in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, Bell then mentions Hades is essentially the Greek version of the Hebrew word Sheol. Um, while that may be true in some Jewish literature, I know which is part of the Orthodox and Catholic canons, I don't think that's quite the case in the New Testament. You know, ideas have changed over time. And I'm going to link to a passage in 1 Enoch um, which describes this series of chambers for the souls of the dead uh, where they're kept until the day of judgment. You know, different compartments for the righteous and wicked. You know, so it, it does assume, you know, the, the ethical dualism of a lot of uh, apocalyptic. And um, this is not a concept uh, which is elaborated in the portions of the Hebrew Bible uh, which refer to Sheol. I'm also going to link to another apocryphal Jewish work called the Apocalypse of Zephaniah, uh, which I think bears close resemblance to the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in the Gospel of Luke. Bell then makes uh, the following rhetorical point. Uh, for many in the modern world, the idea of hell is a holdover from primitive mythic religion that uses fear and punishment to control people for all sorts of devious reasons. And so the logical conclusion is that we've evolved beyond all that outdated belief, right? And uh, he kind of leaves that out in the air. Bell then gets into the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, you know, which describes kind of a role reversal the poor man you know, being taken by angels to Abraham's bosom and the rich man being taken to a place of flames and torment where he can't get any water. So Bell asks the question, people in hell can communicate with people in bliss? You know, because the rich man asks for water and doesn't get it. Um, the thing here is that this parable is describing Hades uh, the temporary holding place of the souls of the righteous and the wicked, it's not describing Gehenna, the place of the last judgment. He then tries to provide this explanation for the parable. Note what it is that the man wants in hell. He wants Lazarus to get him water, 
When you get someone water, you're serving them. The rich man wants Lazarus to serve him. The chasm is the rich man's heart. It hasn't changed even in death and torment and agony. He's still clinging to the old hierarchy. So, in a way, Bell's trying to say that, in essence, um, the rich man is keeping himself separated from the person in bliss. Um, I don't think that uh, interpretation holds water. I think this is a lot more retribu retributive and uh, the, the rich man getting his comeuppance uh, than anything else. Bell then attempts to tackle Matthew chapter 25 verse 46, uh, which in most English translations uh, refers to a place of eternal punishment. Uh, the Greek words are Ionios Colossus. And given the, the buildup uh, which Bell's tried to achieve here, he wants to argue that this is referring to an intense period of correction but I don't think he does so successfully. Um, in particular, I don't think that this works with uh, examples in uh, contemporary Jewish literature, um, which influenced the afterlife ideas in the New Testament quite a lot. Um, chapter 3 of Francis Chan's Erasing Hell also deals with the same phrase and I think is more convincing. Um, that it is referring to eternal punishment. But something which uh, neither of these authors get into is that, you know, if we're going on the, the biblical texts alone, so if we're wanting to try to, you know, adhere to a, a position of biblical exceptionalism, um, which I think Chan does, um, I think that this is just vague enough to slip in the idea of annihilation uh, because the Greek word colossus doesn't necessarily refer to torture or ongoing punishment. You know, annihilation would be a punishment the effects of which are eternal, certainly. Uh, Bell mentions that the Hebrew equivalent to ion, olam, doesn't necessarily mean forever. Um, while that may be true, he also ignores the parallel of eternal life, Ionios Zoe, in the same verse. Uh, the next chapter of the book is called, Does God Get What God Wants? And uh, I think Bell and Francis Chan ask the same question in extremely different ways. Um, like Chan, uh, Bell mentions the verse 1 Timothy 2, 4, which says, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Bell then asks the question, will all people be saved, or will God not get what God wants? Does this magnificent, mighty, marvelous God fail in the end? You know, Chan, however, uh, he will state that God does not actually want all people to be saved because not all people are going to be saved uh, due to God's decreed will, what he causes to happen. However, at the same time, he would affirm that God wants all people to be saved aligns with God's moral will, what pleases him the most. However, Bell doesn't do this. He then quotes Job 23.13 as saying, Who can oppose God? He does whatever he pleases. So while Francis Chan uses this to justify God's ability to punish people forever if he chooses, Bell uses this to justify God's ability to save everyone if he chooses. Bell continues, Is God like the characters in a story Jesus would tell? Old ladies who keep searching for the lost coin until they find it. Shepherds who don't rest until the one sheep is back in the fold. Fathers who rush out to greet and embrace their returning son. Or, in the end, will God give up? Unfortunately, uh, the character of Jesus provided through his parables is a little more complex than Bell's trying to paint here. You know, is he forgetting a passage which he's already had to deal with, Matthew chapter 25? 
where the sheep are separated from the goats and the sheep are given everlasting life and the goats are sent to everlasting punishment. He then mentions, uh, God has to respect our freedom to choose to the very end, even at the risk of the relationship itself. That is going to make a lot of people angry, uh, that statement. He then begins to articulate um, what Anglo-Baptist uh, called, at the time he was reading the book, a Protestant theory of limbo. So he begins by rather selectively quoting from a letter written by Martin Luther to Hans van Reckenberg about the possibility that people could turn to God after death. So the part which Bell quotes was, who would doubt God's ability to do that? Okay, uh, however, Lu Luther does not actually believe this. You know, although such might be inferred by the way this was selectively quoted. So, Bill then cites Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, and Eusebius as believing in universal reconciliation. So, a Greek word which is used to refer to this concept is apokatastasis. So, this is what I predicted would show up in this book. And I'm going to provide a link to uh, some quotes from early church fathers regarding this topic. Bell introduces this to mention, Serious Orthodox followers of Jesus have answered these questions in a number of different ways. Now, while Origen may have been Orthodox in his day, he was later condemned. So... Mentioning him really doesn't help Bell's case at all. He then continues, Telling a story about a god who inflicts unrelenting punishment on people because they didn't do or say or believe the correct things in a brief window of time called life isn't a very good story. Well, for a lot of people, that actually is a good story. They enjoy believing that. They enjoy believing that, you know, people who don't believe like they do or do things which they consider bad are going to have revenge wrought upon them in the end. They enjoy believing that. They love a God who behaves like that. Continuing, um, so will those who have said no to God's love in this life continue to say no in the next? People take that option now, and we can assume it will be taken in the future. So insinuating that people will continue to have the option to say yes and respond positively to God even after they die. He then mentions uh, Revelation 21-15, which refers to the gates of that city in that new world will never shut. But what Bell fails to mention is uh, Revelation 20-15, which talks about people whose names are not found in the Book of Life being thrown into the lake of fire, or in Revelation 22-15, which refers to people who are left outside the gate. He does mention the latter when he says, uh, Can God bring proper lasting justice, banishing certain actions and the people who do them, from the new creation while at the same time allowing and waiting and hoping for the possibility of the reconciliation of those very same people, keeping the gates, in essence, open? But there's a better question, one we can answer, one that takes all of this speculation about the future, which no one has been to, and then returned with hard empirical evidence, and brings it back to one absolute we can depend on in the midst of all this, which turns out to be another question. It's not, does God get what God wants, but do we get what we want? And the answer to that is a resounding, affirming, sure and positive yes. Meaning that uh, if we want to choose 
hell, uh, we're free to do so, and we're free to continue to do so. So in that sense, you know, Bell is not espousing a universalist position, but he is suggesting uh, that people will have chances to respond positively to God after death because that's what God wants and he can do it if he wants to. So, while that may be true, I think that um, Bell needs to essentially walk around or even discard some sections of the scriptures uh, which he has cited here. In chapter 6 he mentions in response to John 14 6 you know, which says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He takes this to mean uh, the all-embracing saving love of this particular Jesus the Christ will of course include all sorts of unexpected people from across the cultural spectrum. What Jesus does declare is that he and he alone is saving everybody. Again, I think that um, he, he interprets passages in ways that are more gracious than the people who wrote them. Um, so it's like while I, I, can, I can kind of admire the way he seems to intuitively do that, um, it's still a way for him to, to get away from saying, I don't agree with this, I think this is wrong. He then quotes John 12, 47 as Jesus saying that he did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So, meaning that this kind of goes into, you know, his idea that God really wants to save everybody. Um, but I thought I would read John chapter 12, verses 44 through 50 to gain a little more context. Then Jesus cried aloud, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. I do not judge anyone who bears my words and does not keep them, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as judge, for I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I speak, therefore, I speak just as the Father has told me. So, I think that the, the passage is inherently more sectarian, uh, then Bell's interpretation lends it. Chapter 7 is titled, The Good News is Better Than That. And um, Bell has this to say regarding a loving God who will send people to hell, or the way most Christians, at least in the uh, United States, or Protestants consider hell. Uh, kind and compassionate, only to become cruel and relentless in the blink of an eye. That kind of God is simply devastating, psychologically crushing. We can't bear it. No one can. It's not psychologically crushing to people who believe that they're part of the in crowd. You know, many people love this concept of God. They love to think uh, that people whom they perceive to be their enemies, are going to be destroyed. They enjoy believing in a God, you know, who's going to have favor on them over everyone else. They, they enjoy being God's special people. He continues, uh, And that is the secret deep in the heart of many people, especially Christians. They don't love God. They can't, because the God they've been presented with and taught about can't be loved. That God is terrifying 
and traumatizing and unbearable. So while there are a lot of people who do love that concept of God, uh, I think that this also lends itself to ideologies in which obedience is more important than love. And, uh, you know, with the rigid ideology, uh, particularly at Calvary Chapels, um, you're kind of programmed to accept what you're told. And, you know, because you're, you're part of the in-group, you know, believing in this kind of God is perfectly fine. Bell continues, uh, God has no desire to inflict pain or agony on anyone. I think you kind of have to go, go against quite a bit of the, the Apocalypse of John here. Um, in addition, I, I would recommend that uh, Rob Bell not read the Apocalypse of Peter, 1st Enoch, or 4th Ezra. You don't want to go there. He then mentions, uh, many have heard the gospel framed in terms of rescue. God has to punish sinners because God is holy. Because Jesus has paid the price for our sin, and so we can have eternal life. However true or untrue that is technically or theologically, what it can do is subtly teach people that Jesus rescues us from God which is precisely what a lot of evangelicals and reformed Protestant churches teach. Jesus rescues you from God. They teach you, you know, that God is so angry at you uh, for being a uh, worthless, filthy, hopeless sinner uh, that he essentially had to kill himself or arrange for himself to be killed uh, in order that he could be angry at somebody other than you. I'm going to link to a video by Paul Washer. You know, he's he's a Calvinist preacher who um, was popular among uh, people who had originally gone to my Calvary Chapel who have kind of moved on. You know, a lot of them actually moved on to um, Calvinism, uh, the ones who remained in the church. And, um, I, I do like this particular clip because it's produced kind of like a horror story, uh, which which is kind of what it is. But yes, pe people people enjoy believing a God that works in this way. You know, it, it's just part part of the 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 apocalyptic dualism. Um, you know, which unfortunately, in my view, uh, permeates a lot of the the gospels and, and the New Testament in general. You know, you have the people of darkness and you have the people of light. You have the people who are the righteous and you have the people who are the wicked. And, uh, of course, the people writing these things are, are on the good side. And, uh, you know, God, God just happens to hate all of the exact same people that they do. So, that, that's, the, um, that's the God that Rob Bell doesn't like. But what Rob Bell isn't willing to do is to say that, you know, the Bible teaches this concept of God. Or rather, you know, the, the writers of the Bible believed in a God that acted in this way. I don't agree with them. I consider the, the God concept that they created to be incorrect or morally wrong, deplorable. But no, he won't do that, at least not yet. He won't do that because because it would cause him to pay dearly. You know, I, I think of Carlton Pearson, uh, to, to uh, provide one example, you know, whose congregation was decimated and eventually he had to leave his church altogether because he could no longer teach uh, the doctrine of hell. So, I'll be waiting for Rob Bell to really stick his neck out. He hasn't quite yet, but he may get there.